Hey, if you like the countdown, don't forget to subscribe to the Space Lab channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at SA underscore Space Lab. Virgin Galactic's rocket plane, which is designed to carry tourists into space, has made plenty of unpowered practice runs. And when Spaceship Two finally turned on its rockets, it broke the speed of sound. I'm Sophie, and welcome to The Countdown. On April 29th, a carrier vehicle lifted Spaceship Two more than 14 kilometers into the air, then released the smaller plane. In earlier test runs, pilots had guided Spaceship Two into a glide back to Earth, but this time, they fired up the plane's rockets and zoomed up to nearly 17 kilometers. During an engine burn lasting only 16 seconds, the plane achieved a speed of more than 400 meters per second, faster than the speed of sound. Although Virgin Galactic is a commercial space line, they haven't sent any flights into space yet. The company is still in the vehicle testing stage, so the success of Spaceship Two's first powered flight is a huge step forward. Hopefully, passengers will soon be able to ride Spaceship Two up 110 kilometers into suborbital space. That is, if they can afford the $200,000 price tag. If suborbital space is too close to home, how about Mars? The Mars One project, which aims to colonize the planet, opened its website for applications on April 22nd. Since then, more than 20,000 would-be astronauts have responded, even though they know it will be a one-way trip. Mars One is a Dutch company hoping to establish a permanent human settlement on the Red Planet. They plan on first sending robots to set up the colony. Then, a group of humans will launch in 2023. Afterwards, follow-up missions will deliver supplies along with more colonists. Mars One thinks reality television and merchandise will be able to pay for their mission's monumental expenses, but just establishing the colony from preparation through the first human landing will cost an estimated $6 billion. Is a TV show enough to pay for it all? Mars One may be overly ambitious. After all, they haven't provided a detailed breakdown of their mission's costs. Do you think this plan is feasible? And if so, would you risk everything for a one-way trip to Mars? Let us know in the comments. Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield has quite the list of accomplishments. He was the first Canadian to walk in space, the first Canadian to command the International Space Station, and now add to that the most popular Canadian YouTube star, in space. Since arriving at the ISS in December 2012, Hadfield has recorded more than 50 videos answering questions about life without gravity. He's covered such topics as how to sleep in space, how to shave in space, how to cook in space, what happens to water in space, and many more about, well, space. Hadfield's most popular video has been watched more than 2 million times, which is a lot considering it's a video of him wringing out a washcloth. Check out Hadfield's videos on the Canadian Space Agency's YouTube channel, and catch him before he returns to Earth on May 13th. NASA's Cassini space probe has been exploring Saturn and its moon since 2004, but it can still manage to surprise us. Just this month, it snapped two sets of mind-blowing images. First, Cassini focused on Saturn's rings, capturing the impact of tiny bodies called meteoroids. These range from one centimeter to a few meters wide. It turns out Saturn's rings can act as meteoroid detectors, revealing that the small objects hit Saturn at about the same rate as they hit Earth. And this similarity can help scientists figure out how different planets formed. From Saturn's rings, Cassini turned its sights to the planet's surface. A massive hurricane has been raging at the North Pole for years, and we finally have pictures of it. Gorgeous, detailed photos and videos in color, false color, and black and white. If you follow Space Lab on Twitter, you may have already seen them. But if you haven't, the new images reveal a storm 20 times larger than your average Earth hurricane. Along the hurricane's outer edges, clouds are zipping along at 150 meters per second, about half the speed of sound. And at the center, the still eye of the storm is about 2,000 kilometers wide, more than half the width of our moon. Cassini can keep its eye on the storm's eye, but I'm keeping my eyes on Cassini. <laughs> When scientists recovered two Antarctic meteorites in 2003, they found grains of a common substance called silica, which also makes up sand. But these particular silica grains have been around long before we had sand, 
or beaches, or even a planet on which a beach could form. In fact, they predate our entire solar system. These ancient silica grains are marked by their chemical makeup. They contain isotopes that can only form during stellar nuclear reactions. According to a paper in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, the silica in the Antarctic meteorites formed when the core of a huge star collapsed in a Type II supernova. The explosion expelled silica, driving the grains into the cluster of material that would later become our solar system. Other bits of silica traveled here more gently by coasting along the wind from an aging star. By studying the chemical makeup of these silica scraps, we can learn about the push that exiled them from their stellar birthplaces and eventually brought them down to Earth. And that's your countdown. Links to all of these stories are in the description below. Also, don't forget to visit the Space Lab channel on YouTube and subscribe. For Scientific American, I'm Sophie Bushwick. And if any of you eccentric billionaires have a cheap flight to space, I am all ears.